This podcast is a quest for well-being, a quest for a meaningful life through the exploration of fundamental truths, enlightening ideas, insights on physical, mental, and spiritual health. The inspiration is love. The aspiration is to awaken new ways of thinking that can lead us to a new way of being. Being well. Welcome to Body, Mind, and Soul Healing Conversations. We know from research done on brainwaves that relaxation brings us into an alpha state and produces healthy hormones. The opposite is true for high beta, a state of stress and survival. When we need to overcome a situation or state of stress, being able to relax is important. But this is just the beginning of meditation and certainly not the end. Meditation is much more than relaxation. When teaching people Raja Yoga meditation, We explain that meditation and yoga are two different things. Meditation is connecting with ourselves to understand and realize that the self is non-physical light energy, atma. Yoga is tuning in and being in union with the Supreme. Valeria Telles interviews Maureen Chen, the author of Mystic at the Edge, a Western woman colored by Asia. A native of Sydney, Australia, Maureen Chen has traveled, read, and learned widely. For almost 45 years, she has studied and taught Raja Yoga meditation with the Brahma Kumaris, establishing and sustaining meditation centers in many countries, including Australia, Hong Kong, Cambodia, and the Philippines. Maureen served as the moderator of the Hong Kong Network on Religion and Peace, chairperson of Unity for Peace, secretary of the Living Values Education Program, and of the Asian Business Leadership Exchange. She also helped to establish the Food Link Foundation, an NGO linking hotels and restaurants with social welfare organizations. She also established social enterprises for victims of landmines, the Khmer Independent Life Team, KILT, and founded the Peace Cafe, a vegetarian community cafe offering values as well as environmental training and working with fair trade initiatives in Siem Reap, Cambodia. Maureen organized over 50 programs in 50 cities in India for the Future of Power project, bringing together leaders from 20 different professional fields to explore the use of soft power. She is currently the coordinator of the Yara Valley Living Center, operated by the Brahma Kumaris. Maureen hosts the weekly Living Well series for the Brahma Kumaris Australian Virtual Center. Meet Maureen at learnmeditationonline.org and brahmakumaris.org. Here is the interview with Maureen Chen. In your own words, who is Maureen Chen? Ah, oh, that's an interesting question. A big one. So I guess I've... Um, from a young age, being curious and being curious has helped me to step outside my boundaries. And so, yeah, I love to explore and enrich my life with all that I encounter. That's Maureen Chen, I guess. I love that. That's interesting. One of my conversations today, that's exactly how we've begun. That's how my last guest answered her. Part of her answer included being curious. And we talked about judgment and curiosity. Because people often say I'm courageous. And I find that very interesting that curiosity gives us more courage than bravery. I wouldn't say I'm bravely courageous. I'm curiously courageous. My second official question is spirituality. How do you define spirituality these days? Well, you know, I think as you're aware, this organization is run by women and the former, um, you know, head of the organization, if you like, was Daddy Janky. And when she was asked this question, she said, spirituality is to ask yourself, 
what am I meant to be doing now? Mm. And I find that interesting. For example, you know, if somebody's running late and I'm waiting, what am I meant to be doing now? Am I meant to be getting impatient or worked up or, you know, it's kind of a moment by moment awareness. Is there an intention behind that kind of awareness or it's just doing what it does? I think the awareness is to stay true to myself because I think we all experience when we're not aware, any moment we can react and then we think, oh, that wasn't me. Right. Yes. <laughs> so I think when we're aware, yeah. we're more aligned with who we really are rather than, you know, all the buttons and that can be pressed from time to time. And mystic, we hear that word a lot. Um, I do, and I love that word for some reason. So what is to be a mystic and what does it look like to live as one? Yeah, I hesitated to use this word for the book because some people said, oh, sounds like almost like a saint. Yeah, but yeah. to me, a mystic is someone who has the intention to experience rather than believe and follow. So I yeah. think it's important for people to be able to question and come to their own personal understanding of their practices and what they're learning and to evolve, I would say, from being a believer mm. to a mystic meaning not, I don't just believe it, I kind of know it for myself mm. in my own experience. In your book, you raise a question, an interesting question that for some reason I thought about asking you before reading this passage in your book. You ask a question about love and compassion, if they are the same. What is love and is compassion the same as love? So talk to me about that question. What would be your answer to that question? Yeah, this emerged because someone was living with me for several years in a meditation center and I had a great feeling for her. We never had any conflict. But she said to me after some years, she said, you've never loved me. And I thought, really? Because I had nothing but good experience with her. And I would say that I loved her. So I thought about that because my kind of love is often facilitating what's good for another person but not necessarily just sitting down and having a cup of tea. Right, yes. <laughs> and yeah, so I, I thought, oh, my love so often comes from compassion in the sense of mm. helping. Um, but I think love is a bit more spontaneous. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> mm, so that was an interesting thing to explore in myself. I connect unconditional to love always, unconditional love. I think I talk to you off record about briefly, that yeah. whatever life is, is unconditional love. And that's the foundation we all unconditionally love. It's a miracle to be in a human body, to be here now talking to you. It comes to me every time in, in such a way. Not that I get to experience the human side from that perspective, but that is like this unknowable truth <laughs> that keeps dancing around me. But I think the words can be a little bit confusing when we say, I mean, I, I completely agree and understand, but often when people try to practice unconditional love, yeah. they kind of don't have boundaries. And mm. I think we need to have boundaries together with the unconditional love True. because otherwise it gets confusing. <laughs> yeah, it gets and complicated. It often, <laughs> yeah, and it often so moves true. from love to fear because mm. we want so much for the other to reciprocate that love because, mm. you know, often when we love, we f can't understand why there's not a return of that love. I don't mean in a sense of expectation of something material, but we we feel it. Why isn't it two ways? But very often we need boundaries in our relationships. So others don't, you know, um, so we don't tolerate unacceptable behavior, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Unacceptable behavior, I mean, kind of acting out and 
abuse and yeah. unconditional love sometimes gets confused with that. That wouldn't be love, <laughs> abuse. But when unconditional, I guess it's just this idea that life encompasses everything. It's the good and the bad. And, and that's the gift for this experience to be, to happen. Then we need both the good and the bad that we label in such a way. But this is just part of wholeness. I guess that's what I call unconditional love, but we're using words that, that can become very tricky. Yeah, words, right. that's the problem. <laughs> yeah. That's why I hesitated to write a book because, you, you know, that. words yeah. are so limiting. They can be interpreted in so many ways. <laughs> that's true. And as the Taoists say, those who speak, those who know don't speak. Mm. You know, those who speak <laughs> often don't know. So. <laughs> And I wonder, can we speak really the unspeakable? You say something in your book, oh, I already wanted to get there to your book that caught my attention, about the truth. You say, oh, I love what you said in your book. I have to find here. You say, yeah, truth encompasses paradox. Yeah. You cannot show or speak the truth without creating this paradox, without showing the paradox of, of everything. Yeah, that's right. And one of one of the aims of writing the book was to also share all uh, all the things, so many of the things that I've learned from others. And together with my deep interest in Raj Yoga meditation, I also have a deep interest in nonviolent communication. Mm, yeah. And I think this is how I'm attempting to improve, I would say, how I express because, yeah, <laughs> it's a real art of being able to communicate. So I have a few more warm-up questions for you, Maureen, before I ask you questions related to the book specifically. The purpose of the human experience, do you see one? Is there a purpose to this experience of being a human? Oh, that's an interesting question. I do accept that we are here. <laughs> so you know, that we are here. And I don't know if there's a reason why we're here, but we are here. So I think the purpose of the human experience is to stay true to my intrinsic self and express that because we all experience that. Well, my experience of myself and others is that our original nature is peaceful, loving, happy, because we thrive in that state. And so my purpose of being human is to live from that space because then I enjoy every moment. So when I'm connected to myself and connected to the other, accepting that, you know, and I guess believing that we are intrinsically good, then I enjoy that interaction, even if it's a little clumsy or, you know, not not so smooth. And it's what is called in the practice I do, soul consciousness. So really connecting with the spirit of the other person, myself as a spirit, because, you know, as they say, we're 99.99999% the same in the sense that we're only 1.00001% uh, physical in that sense. So, you know, we really are the same, no matter our costume, our background, our language. And so if I can connect with others coming from that awareness, I can feel so close. And when I feel close, I feel love. Yeah, if I could uh, constantly be in that state, that would be my goal, I would say. Wow, what a beautiful answer. And I love the way you begin to answer that question. Yeah, I accepted that I'm here. <laughs> that is yeah. an interesting. Yeah, because we are everywhere, aren't we? <laughs> it's not just here. <laughs> also, yeah. Or who is here in the first place? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's a good question to ask too. Uh, so Maureen, let me see. Freedom. What is your idea and understanding of freedom, of liberation? You know, you'll see from the book that I love quotes, and I I read one years ago that said, freedom is discipline. And again, what a paradox. Freedom yeah. is discipline. Right. So when I can 
yeah, discipline's another very interesting word. But when I can really, to me, discipline means doing what I really want to do. Like, for example, I might want to get go, get up and go jogging in the morning. Yeah. If I don't have the discipline, I can't have the freedom to do what I really want to do. Mm. So that's what I mean by discipline. Yeah, doing what I understand it. by discipline. Yeah, it's self-discipline. It's not disciplining others, but. Mm. That makes sense to me. So freedom, in a way, comes with responsibility. Freedom is not free, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. What about spiritual liberation? What would that look like? Have you had any glimpse of that? Yeah, there's a word that's used in Sanskrit called liberation in life. And to me, what that means is to live in this world in a state of freedom. And so that's why I think there's so much I need to study and think about so that I can interact and not place bondages on myself or others, wow. you know, so so yeah. that I can live in freedom. Would that imply no judgment, no belief systems? Yeah, and no expectations. No expectations to results because there's no destination anyway. It seems like from this perspective here, there's no uh, where to go, but this is wholeness itself. Yeah. And I think I can just draw on, you know, what I've kind of understood from the Gita was the main message I took from it. There's many messages, but it talks about being aligned with a state that's called sato. And sato means truth. And when we're aligned with truth, we do everything because we understand at this moment it's the right thing to do and we don't look at the consequences of that. We just do what is right. And I've tried to practice this for a few decades and I find that, yeah, that really um, brings the best result. N maybe not in the short term, but in the long term, the best results is when I just do what I think is right And, you know, not think too much about the consequences of that or getting something in return for that. So I love the way how you emphasize your right, whatever is right to you. Yeah. Yeah, it's only what I understand at this moment. Yeah, to be right or to be true. So I love, I heard mm. that before, like there's no ultimate truth, but the ultimate truth is your truth. But we do kind of um, talk and read a lot and we have so many practices, so many ama amazing uh, messengers who um, point to the truth of what this reality really is. And the ones that I'm very much resonates with me is the um, non-duality or the idea that there's no... Non-duality also includes duality, of course. This idea of not having a life, but being life, really. That always resonated. Yeah. Yeah. It makes that's sense. A nice one. Mm. Yeah. I don't have a life. I am life. So you wrote the book Mystic at the Edge, a Western woman colored by Asia. Talk to me about the main inspiration and intention of writing your book, Maureen. Yeah, well, I think the aim was to you know, many people sit in meditation, and I think a lot of people who don't meditate wonder what are they doing sitting there? Yes. So I guess it's an invitation <laughs> yeah. for people to step inside my inner world so they can just look in. And and my world um, is my world and I'm expressing the conclusions, I guess, I've come to at this point of how I go forward, the choices of why I think this and why I'm doing this. And I don't you know, want people to agree with me. But what I like is if people think about these things. So um, just bringing up so many things that I hope that people who read it would just think for themselves what, you know, because as you can see from the book, it's a bit of a comparison also, because I've lived in, you know, so many different cultures, and I've studied a lot of different religions because I've been interested in that and philosophies. So it kind of invites people in to think about many things. And I remember I used to go to prisons and um, 
you know, engage with some people. And I left a book called um, from Mahatma Gandhi's autobiography, Experimenting with Truth. And I felt that that was the most effective book because it really helped people to just think about different aspects. And I guess, you know, my book is a bit inspired by that of just being who I am and letting others think about that and, and how it sits against their their ideas and their life. So in speaking of inspiration, talk to me for a moment about that initial journey that you went on with your husband or even before meeting him. Yeah, I know you're you're a Catholic, really, but you didn't have any constraints. And then you also said something in your book that caught my attention about I grew up under the white Australian policy. What does it mean? I was wondering. Oh, okay. Yeah, so first of all, yeah, I was brought up as a Catholic, but I must have been a bit of a thinker because when I was 11, I refused to go to church. And I just felt it didn't sit some things, especially that I was brought up in a very fear-based tradition. You know, not all Catholics experience that, yeah. but I did. Yeah. And so it didn't sit with me. And um, I grew up in a what I mean by this white Australian policy. Australia had a policy where they didn't allow Asians or coloured people into Australia. So our immigrants were more from the Middle East or, you know, from even a Christian background. So I had not met an Asian or a coloured person when I, until the age of about 18, 19. Mm -hmm. There was one girl in school that was Chinese, but I didn't really get to know her. And so, you know, this curiosity for the other yeah. <laughs> was very alive in me. And I ended up marrying um, a Chinese person. I remember when I got to know him, I thought, oh, he thinks quite similar to me as if like they would even think differently. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but it right. was like I was that, you know, <laughs> unaware of yeah. what goes on in people of different cultures. <laughs> yeah. So it, we, when I met him, he was going to be a Buddhist monk. And he told me, you know, don't marry me. I don't like this world. I don't want to bring anyone into this world. I just want to understand what I'm doing here. So I thought, oh, he's, that sounds pretty negative. I, as we often think when we meet someone, they will change. But I changed and came around to his way of thinking quite quickly. So we set off just about four months after we got married to to Asia. And in particular, we were headed for India to explore uh, monasteries to see whether we could become a monk and a nun. <laughs> so it was a very different, uh, different marriage. <laughs> so, yeah, that's where we kind of started. And yeah, it's just ended up, I've ended up being in Asia for over 30 years. Now I'm back in Australia because of COVID. I was in Taiwan setting up a center, but I ended up back in Australia now. Talk to me for a moment about how you discovered, I'm not sure if I will pronounce this correctly, but I'll try, uh, Raja Yoga Meditation. That, that's okay. Yeah. I, Tom and I were looking to, you know, become a monk and a nun in a monastery. But as I was saying before, I didn't experience that equality with women, you know, we're thinking, you know, take this takes us back to, to the seventies, but even now it's still something that uh, women are struggling with. And, um, so first thing is they weren't the monasteries we visited, they weren't vegetarian and we'd become vegetarian because of the loving kindness and compassion of Buddhism. Secondly, women weren't treated equally, which I said, I can become a monk, but I can't become a nun. <laughs> and the third thing was also that it was worship. And I wasn't, we weren't looking to worship. We wanted to study and understand and evolve. So it's hard to find a place where, you know, it really uh, fits with what you're looking for. And so when we came back to Australia, we happened to cr come across the Brahma Kumaris, which is the Raj Yoga I study, is, is through the Brahma Kumaris. 
And it's an organisation run by women, so that ticked that box. It's vegetarian and many of us now are vegan. And also uh, women are put in front, but men also have almost equal opportunity. They, you know, women are really put in front as far as the administration and the teaching, but it's not exclusive. So I think it sat with me. And also it's there's no worship, it's a study. So it ticked the boxes that we were looking for. So what's the philosophy in the spiritual teachings of Brahma Kamaris? Yeah, the, the um, Raja Yoga means, yoga means union. So it's a connection with a higher power. And Raja means king. So the idea is by aligning with that light, I'm able to become a master of myself by kind of lifting my consciousness and my awareness. So that's the practice. So there's no prayer or worship, but it's connection with mm. that power. Yes. Yeah. Connection to the essence. It's almost like a return, which there's no return because we're already there in a way. It's just remembering or um, it's like the impossible becoming possible because it's almost yes. like impossible <laughs> to go, yeah. uh, to return to what uh, we never left anyway. So it's... Um, yeah. And what I speak about, you know, why, you know, in the beginning of the book is that we don't really look to learn anything. We're seeking to discover what resonates with our own truth. Yeah. Right. And so, right. you know, that's why meditation is so uh beneficial, I would say. And in Aboriginal language, they have this word dadiri, which means deep listening, that everything we need to know is inside. So that deep listening, and also when I want to connect with others, to deeply listen to them, to deeply listen to nature, the trees and the flowers. I mean, it's just such a beautiful practice that helps us to, res you know, to resonate with ourselves, deep listening. You are at the moment a coordinator of the Yara Valley Living Center. There you host the uh, Living Well series. I'll have the link on your podcast profile, but talk to me for a moment about that. Yeah, well, we've stepped into a place that was that has been run by the Gawler Foundation. So it's a retreat center that offers um, a plant-based diet and a meditation practice for people living with cancer, Parkinson, and MS. And unfortunately, during COVID, they weren't able to continue because you know, they had paid staff and all of our the people that are here now are all volunteers. So, you know, having us run this Yarra Valley Living Center means that it can continue and we will still host their retreats, also retreats for plant-based immer uh, health immersion experiences so people can change from a, a non-plant-based diet to a plant-based diet. And we do our own retreats on in silence and meditation and healing different aspects. But yeah, we're really happy to have fallen into a place that had a, already this name, Living Center, because like your series, I thought that was a good match that we've come into this quest for well-being. So the Living Series, the Living Well series, I'm interviewing people about mental health, diet, um, exercise, aging, similar, a little bit oh. similar to what you're doing. So, yeah, yeah. yeah, and these are just friends and people who drop in. I just interview them and, yeah, I'm enjoying it immensely. <laughs> <laughs> Tell me about a lot it. from each one I interview, like I'm sure you experience. Yes, absolutely. This is a, an amazing journey, another journey experience of reconnecting, it sounds to me. By listening to others, we reconnect with ourselves too. We, it kind of, it resonates. That truth resonates in between and that becomes magical in a way. Uh, so in your book, you say, when someone is exposed beyond their personal selective world to what is happening around them, they can be a deep awakening in the heart. So I would love to hear from you 
if this was the inspiration in a way for you to be part of so many foundations and nonprofit organizations, programs, what has been your experience with them, Maureen? Yeah, I think one of the very deep experiences was living in Cambodia for four years and being exposed to a war-torn country that's trying to rebuild itself. And I happened to come in contact with a group of people that living with the outfall of landmines, so people who have lost limbs, legs and arms, and, and um, they were being taken advantage of, really. <laughs> And, you know, I don't know. Anyway, that's a story. So I helped to set up the uh, Khmer, it's called the Kilt, Khmer Independent Life Team. And it was really to help them to be independent. So a friend of mine came over from Hong Kong. We taught them how to make jewellery. So Jewels of Peace, I think that's the name of it. And that's something I should have sent you a link for because they are making jewelry. We've, we now have a website and she provides them with semi-precious stones and they make, they use um, Chinese knotting to make these this jewelry. So really helping people to be independent, that's I think a big, big thing. Oh, wow. Yeah, please send me the link. I'll, I'll include yeah. it in the podcast profile. We still yeah, have time. <laughs> because it's someone in America who um, yeah. who actually has a Khmer Independent Life Team. So that's one thing that you can just look up and you would find it. And Jewels of Peace. So I'll just put that in, in here. Yeah. So chapter one is titled Awakening the Heart. And the question is, can we avoid suffering? That's an interesting question. Yeah. <laughs> what would be I think yours? from a young age, I was thinking, you know, how can I stop the suffering in the world? You know, what can yeah. I do? Yeah. And also, can you imagine when I was maybe about 18, I thought, you know, I don't mind dying now. I've had such a good life. It's been very happy. And, and I see everyone around me suffering. So it was a bit of fear of the unknown, <laughs> yeah. can you imagine? <laughs> so a fear of suffering, I guess. And yeah. I think, yeah, one of the things, I wasn't really looking for God. I didn't believe in yeah. God at that time or a higher power. Yeah. I was looking for an understanding of suffering. And I realized I was looking for the philosophy of karma yeah. because I think that is so deep to understand mm. whatever I do comes back to me. And, um, yeah, I learned it in Indonesian, studying Indonesian in school. And I thought, oh, I have to go to Indonesia. I have to find out more about this. It was just the thing I was looking for, the understanding of karma. So, yeah. That's interesting, the law of karma. that We all know that intrinsically. But for some reason, I wonder why this reality is so divided with so many people doing quite the opposite of good. Yeah, and even people who believe <laughs> in the philosophy of karma, they get so affected by situations. And I say, but can't you see what's behind it? Like, just look look at it through the eyes of, of karma and maybe there's some insight into that. You know, so I find it's very insightful. And also interesting, one of the people I interviewed in The Living Well, I asked her, you know, she always seems to do the right thing. And, you know, like what what is appropriate? She shares, you know, appropriately. And I said, is that because of your understanding of karma? And she said, oh, no, I do everything for blessings. <laughs> and I just love that. She said, if I do the right thing, people give me blessings. If not, they kind of curse me because, or they, you know, they have waste thoughts about me. And I thought, oh, that's a beautiful way of looking at it because calm has got a bit of a heavy, you know, overtone to it. But to do things for blessings, <laughs> I'd that's really different. Like that. And it's lighter. You're right. Instead of seeing as a punishment, right? Don't do this. Oh, yeah. I like that better. And then I always go back to the questions about control. Who is doing anything? Like, who is the doer of our actions and our thoughts? And control, right, Maureen? Who is controlling this? Is there someone that we call the universe, higher power, God? Is there 
really something that's controlling everything or life is just happening? Yeah, well, one thing, just going back to that word sato and aligning with truth, um, it says in the Gita, the greatest illusion of human beings is that they think that they are doing something, whereas it's the three gunas, the sato, rajo, and tamo, probably don't have time to go into that, but but that as is really, it's like, what am I aligned with? So whatever I'm aligned with, that's controlling me. So for me, I want to be under the influence of sato. I want to be aligned with truth and let that control me in a sense. But also on the other side of is there something controlling the world, I see the everything as a drama. And also I talk in the book about destiny and free will because there's all these things that take a little bit of thinking about, but I do see that there is a line that for me, there's a, a natural line that I that's kind of my path. And if I can get on my line, things flow. I feel I'm in the right place at the right time. And do you know, I'm sure you know what I mean. <laughs> so that alignment with truth helps me to, it's my truth. So it helps me to be on my line. And I think as far as we are off our line, that's the stress in our life. The resonance that we've been talking about, it might be that, that you call it alignment with truth or the Gita. So yeah, that might be the resonance of that truth that once we know that we are in, in touch with the resonance, then it's, yeah, it's easier to just let life flow as it would naturally without judgments with without condemning anything or ourselves so, I mean there's no self here there's no self that's doing anything anyway but what a fantastic journey <laughs> I keeps going back to the it amazes me Maureen that we can realize these things like how come you know how can we wake up in the middle of the dream when there's no dream or dreamer but there's someone sense of being awakened somewhere somehow so that is fantastic. <laughs> so we're almost at the end, and I do have a few more notes here that caught my attention. In your book, you say, love is not about possession. It is all about appreciation. There was uh, a Chinese proverb, and you mentioned that, when you're talking about your relationship, marriage with your husband. Yeah. Under yeah. part two, applied spirituality, you mentioned something that caught my attention. You said perfection is a state of complete contentment. I mean, you said more than that, but that caught my attention, this phrase. Yeah. Yeah, because if you look at the word, the content of my yeah. being. So I'm content when I've rediscovered all the parts of my being. Yeah. So then my content is full. So that's what I think I'm trying to do. I'm trying to, you know, put back all the pieces and, and um, because it's interesting that everyone's contentment yeah. is different. True. So it's not, it's, there's not a, a specific content for each one, but it's a matter of what is my content. Yeah, right. <laughs> and finding that. I love yeah. the experiments you have too. After each section or passage with a, a teaching or spiritual uh, suggestions or lesson, you have the experiment. Uh, I love that too. In, in that section, you have one that says, think of a personal experience you have had of perfection and capture that feeling. Mm, yeah, because I think we've all experienced it in moments. And, and I think those moments are so important for us, aren't they? Because we know it, then we know it. Mm. Also, the comfort zone, that's a question that I have here for you. We're almost at the end and I'm like, oh my God, my boundaries with time. <laughs> I want to I <laughs> ask you, the comfort zone, how do we learn to say yes to something that is challenging our comfort zones? How do we find the wisdom to say yes? It seems like we have to overcome fear, right, Marin, to get there. Yeah, well, that's why I call the book Mystic at the Edge, because it's all about not settling into a comfort zone, being ready for opportunity, for change. And for me, I'm aware that 
you know, what we have at the moment, in fact, what we have now is so much, so different to what we had two years ago since COVID. So there is no comfort zone in reality. And if we have that illusion, we're just going to feel things ripped away from us. So, you know, I was asked to go to Pakistan and I was a little afraid, actually. And then I thought, well, a lot of the world lives in in that fear of kidnapping, which is a real fear there. And um, and so let me, you know, let me experience that as well, because who knows when I'll be living in a state like that and I have no choice of it. Now I have a choice to go in and out. I'm so fortunate. So I really do appreciate opportunities. You know, like we lost our power for five days and you know, we do have a generator, but we wanted to try and see how we manage without any power. So we used it minimally, and that was felt to be a bit indulgent, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but it's like, it's good. It was a good experience because who knows, any time we can lose what we're dependent mm. on. So better to practice ahead of time. Yeah. And and like you said, it's, you know, there is sometimes a fear, but curiosity has been what's taken me beyond fear more than anything oh, else. I love that. Being guided by curiosity, right? But you started the conversation like that. What a beautiful invitation. Thank you so much, Maureen, for your wisdom and presence here on this podcast. Thank you so much, Valeria, for all that you are doing. It's just wonderful. Thank you for the encouragement. The body appreciates very much. <laughs> so I have a few more questions for you. The ending questions, Maureen. Would you like to add anything or read a passage in your book before that? Uh, I think I just chose one randomly, and it's holding the vision. So I start every little section with a quote, and this one is, Angels. Don't worry about anyone. They believe in them. Sometimes I worry about my family and friends when they're facing difficult challenges. However, worrying about something or someone disempowers both ourselves and others. It's important and helpful to believe in others and not worry about them. So true. Yeah, we do get caught up in worries, yeah, overthinking and all that. It causes more anxiety. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was an anonymous quote, but just wonderful. Don't worry about anyone. Believe in them. Beautiful reminder. And also yeah. an, another thing in that particular section yeah. is from Larry Dossie's book. Um, and he says in his book, um, healing prayer, that it doesn't matter if you're in the same room as someone or on the other side of the planet, your thoughts reach them because we are not local. The soul is not local. I'm not separated from you, mm. Valeria. You know, we're thousands right, of miles right. away, but <laughs> we're not separate. We're not local. Our feelings can connect. So whether you're in the same room with someone or the other side of the world, it can have the same impact. And I think that's very important at this time where a lot of people are experience, experiencing separation. And I do have two more questions for you. One is a technical question, but I have um, this one. What are three things about life you know for sure as of this moment? Wow, uh, that we'll all die. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I think that's a good thing to stay aware of sure. because then I live each moment. I feel the joy of being yeah. alive. Huh. I am. Yeah. And the third one would be I am love. I think that's empowered me a lot that I don't need love. I am love. Yes, a billion times to that. <laughs> Unconditional love. Yes, yes, yeah. And before we say goodbye, where can we find more information about you, your books, products, services, and future projects? Yeah, well, I think if you if you Google Mystic at the Edge, you'll probably find a Facebook page and the book and, yeah, some things about me. <laughs> Mystic at the Edge, I think, is <laughs> the easiest route. <laughs> Yeah, I have the links and I'll have on your podcast profile both of your links, the Brahma Kumari too. I have that one here. And the other link, I know you sent it to me. I'll have the one that we mentioned uh, throughout the conversation. I forgot the name now. Yeah, Jewels I did send in the chat, uh, Khmer Independent Life Team. Yeah, Khmer so Independent Life Team, KILT, K-I-L-T. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much again, Maureen. We'll talk soon. Okay, thanks. Bye for now. Om Shanti, we say. I am peace. That sounds good. (laughs) (laughs) Om Shanti. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening. To learn more about Maureen Chen and her work, please visit learnmeditationonline.org and brahmakumaris.org. To learn more about this podcast, please visit fitforjoy.org slash podcast. Thank you again for listening and bye for now.